Hello, and welcome to the Community of Faith Church Online podcast. I hope this message inspires you and encourages you. If you have any questions at all, you can email admin at cofchurches.com. Thank you, and have a great day. Well, hey, good morning, and welcome to Community of Faith Church Online. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Brandon, and I'm one of the pastors here at Community of Faith. And we're just so grateful that you're joining us today. Uh, we're going to continue in our series that we started last week uh, called Designed to Worship. Designed to Worship. If you tuned in last week, if you weren't able to, uh, you can go back and find the message on online or on our app or here on Facebook. Uh, but what we talked about last week uh, was what worship is. We defined worship. That worship is to ascribe ultimate value or worth to someone or something. You and I, we discussed, we don't get a choice to be a worshiper or not. No, we're worshipers. We were created to worship. The question simply is, who or what are you worshiping? And so in this series, our goal is that we're going to teach you what worship is. We're going to teach you why we worship, how we worship, and what happens when we worship. And so as we continued last week, we, we likened worship to a paint set. Do you remember this? That paint outside of the canvas is a mess. It gets on shoes and clothes. And if you handed a paint set to a child with no direction, it would be chaos. Well, when you worship without direction, when your worship isn't to the canvas and your worship isn't geared towards God, it creates a mess in your life. It's destructive, just like paint outside of the canvas. Who or what are you worshiping? And, and so today I actually want to look at why we worship. Can we consider that for just a second? Like, why do we worship God? What's the purpose? Well, what's the meaning of that? I really want to ask, what's the heart of worship? Why do we do this? Do we worship because God's insecure? Like, have you ever thought through this? Do we worship because maybe God's having a bad day and he needs a, a pick-me-up? He needs a pat on the back? Does God need reminded of how awesome he is? Is this why we worship? No. God is not insecure. God is not emotionally unstable, just begging for you to tell him how awesome he is because he's forgotten. No. Our God is perfect. Our God is abundant. Our God lacks nothing. He is complete. Friends, listen, God doesn't need your worship. He doesn't. He doesn't need anything. But God does invite you to worship. Let me say it like this. Worship is not a necessity to God. His character isn't depending on whether you acknowledge him and worship him or not. He is God all by himself. It's not a necessity, but there has been an invitation given to you to worship. Last week, we said that from Ecclesiastes that God literally, he planted eternity in, in the human heart. He, he created in us this mysterious longing for which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. And God's invitation is, hey, with that longing, with what I've planted in your heart, I mean, I'm inviting you to worship me. Why? Why would God invite us to worship him? Because he loves you. Because he wants what's best for you. Because when paint finds the canvas, when, when your worship finds the creator the way it was intended to be, there's nothing more satisfying for you and me. There's nothing more fulfilling and gratifying than when we worship God. I love it because worship is where we take our eyes off of ourselves. We live in such a selfish, self-centered society, don't we? So much of our world and our culture is about us living for us. You only live once. Self-care, self-medicate, it's all, so much of it's all about us. The beautiful part of worship is that it doesn't have anything to do with me. It has everything to do with him. It's where I take my eyes off of myself, my eyes off of what's around me, and I simply look at him. I want to define the heart of worship, why we do it. The heart of worship in and of itself is to acknowledge and thank God for all that he is and all that he does. Listen to that again. The heart of our worship, what's behind it all? It's that we would acknowledge and thank God for all that he is and all that he does. 
And did you catch that? That nowhere in our definition of the heart of worship, the reason we worship, nothing in there had anything to do with me or you. Because worship isn't about us. Worship is for God. It is to God. It is about God. It is by God. That's why I'm not preaching this morning about the benefits of worshiping. Because that's not what it's truly about. I'm not talking about the breakthrough or the results or the byproduct of worship today, because if that's the real reason you worship God so that he'll just do something or give you something, you are missing the whole point of worship. So I just want to make two observations today uh, in our sermon, two observations of why we worship. And the first one is this, if you're taking notes. Worship is our response to who God is. Worship is first and foremost our response to who God is. The real reason we worship church is found in the very first verse in your Bible. Genesis chapter 1 in verse 1 that says, In the beginning, God. Let's just consider this for a moment, right? We worship God because he's God. Like he, he, he is, he's the alpha and the omega. We worship God because he is the creator of the cosmos. He, he literally created with his breath, the very stars in our galaxy and universe. And he knows them by name and he knows how many of them there are. He's the mountain sculptor. He, he's the ocean holder. We worship God first and foremost because he is in fact God and his character needs no alterations. His character needs no adjustments. He is God alone, God all by himself. We worship him because of who he is. And and I want to show you this maybe even in in a greater depth in Isaiah chapter 40. And we're going to just read verse 12 through 16. And this is a little bit lengthy, but I want you to understand just the vastness and the greatness of our God. And, and this is truly why we worship him. This is what it says in, in Isaiah. It says, who else has held the oceans in his hands? Who else has done that? Think about it. Who else has held the oceans? Who else has measured off the heavens with his very fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth and has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? Who is able to advise the spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or to teach him anything? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instruction about what is good? Did somebody teach him what is right or show him the path of justice? No, for all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They're nothing more than dust on the scales. God picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. And verse 16 says this, all the wood in Lebanon's forest, all of Lebanon's animals would not be enough to make a burnt offering worthy of our God. As we consider all that he is, Think about this. It it just said all all the wood in Lebanon's forest, how many trees are within the very forest? All the timber, all the lumber would not be enough to make a burnt offering worthy of our God. All of the animals, hundreds upon hundreds, thousands upon thousands. Think of how many animals fill the forest. They wouldn't be enough to create an altar of worship worthy of our God. It, It doesn't even scratch the surface of what he deserves. I I just, I don't know about you this morning, but I just feel this thing. I don't know about you, but I just get this sense that worship is so much more than, than Jericho walls falling down and prison doors flinging open. Because when, when they worshiped in, in scripture, that Jericho walls fell down, you remember this, when they worshiped Paul and Silas, they were worshiping and, and the prison doors flung open. I have this feeling though that worship is so much more than the results. Worship is so much more than breakthroughs taking place and situations changing. Worship is about him. Not about just what he can do, but first and foremost, we worship God for just simply who he is. He's God and God alone. And we see this so beautifully in Matthew chapter two, verse 11. Um, 
the wise men that show up at, at the birth of Jesus. Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, they, they show up, and this is what it says. It says, After entering the house, these kings, these men, they saw the child with Mary, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then after opening their treasure gifts, they presented, uh, they presented him gifts fit for a king, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Think about the journey these guys had, right? These foreign kings, they travel uh, over 500 miles looking for Jesus, following the stars, trying to find the one, the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. They, they went on a journey of over 500 miles. Like they probably had to deal with the hot, intense sun, right? They probably got sunburned. They, they probably had a wind that was blowing dust in their faces. I mean, they are traveling over 500 miles on the back of camels throughout the desert. I mean, can, can you consider this? They probably had uh, sore muscles, right? They, they, they probably uh, even had blisters on their feet as they walked getting to Jesus, making this journey seems a bit inconvenient, right? A 500 mile journey. But they sacrifice of their time. They sacrifice of their resources. They sacrifice their comfort. Why? To come and worship the King. And the Bible says this, we just read it, that when they saw the child, when they saw God, they could not help but worship him. In this moment, they are worshiping a toddler. I, I mean, Jesus hasn't preached one single sermon at this point. They bring gifts, they bring worship, and Jesus hasn't performed one sign, one wonder, one miracle. Jesus hasn't even went to the cross yet, but these men of royalty and honor, these foreign kings, these wealthy scholars, when they see God, all they can do is fall on their faces in the dust of the ground and worship him. They didn't worship because of what Jesus had done. They didn't worship because of a miracle he performed. They weren't responding to an altar call at the end of a sermon. They were simply worshiping God with expecting nothing in return, no strings attached, worshiping him for who he is. And they even gave gifts for who he is. You know what they understood about worship that I think sometimes we miss? They understood that the heart of worship was not to make an investment and get a return they understood that the heart of worship was to make a sacrifice and offer up a gift. That's why they were willing to sacrifice everything. I mean, how long did it take for them to travel over 500 miles? But they understood the power and the significance of the one they came to worship. There was nothing too inconvenient for them. There was nothing too difficult. There was nothing that they wouldn't do to come worship God for who he is. They understood the value of, of the one they were worshiping. Man, the heart of our worship, the reason we do it cannot be to make an investment with God so that he'll do something for us. The heart of our worship has to be like these men to make a sacrifice and offer a gift. And worship, it, it will cost you your comfort. It will cost you your convenience. But is Jesus not worthy of that? These men obviously thought so. Is Jesus not worthy of you sacrificing your comfort? You see, there are some of us who we refuse to sing because we don't want anybody to hear us. We refuse to engage and would rather spectate because we don't want anybody to look at us. We, we, we are unwilling to sacrifice our comfort, so we'll never lift our hands and, 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 and surrender to God. We, we won't do it because we're not willing to let go of our comfort. Is he not worthy? What, 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 do you think it was comfortable for Jesus to go to the cross for you? Come on, he, he is worthy of a worship that costs you something. It costs Jesus everything. How can we hold anything back from him? Worship, here's my second point. 
first is this, that we worship God for who he is. And the second thing is we worship God from what he's done. It's our response to what God has already done. If we're honest, uh, don't we sometimes say things like this? Well, God, when you answer my prayer request, then I'll worship you. I'll, I'll, I'll cut you a deal, God, uh, when I get the breakthrough, when I get the miracle, um, w- when uh, you show up and, and you change my situation or my circumstance, then you hold up to your end of the deal. Then I, I promise y'all, I'll worship you then. But you need to know this. If God never did one more single thing for any of us, the fact that he sent his son to die on a cross for you is more than enough reason to worship for the rest of your life. If he never did anything else, I'm telling you, if he never answered one more prayer request I had, the fact that he sent Jesus so that I could have life and life everlasting is more than enough reason to worship him and praise him for the rest of my life. Come on, we worship God because he gave us life through his son. We worship him because the blood of his son cleanses us, frees us, redeems us, forgives us, removes our sin, and gives us life forevermore. If you're withholding your worship from God until you think he's worthy, you've missed the whole point. If you are withholding your worship until you think God has proved himself, like he's got some more earning and working to do before you worship him, if that's how you feel, you have missed the entire point. And what you're saying is that the cross clearly wasn't enough. What he did, he's got to do more before I worship him. That's what you're saying. In the reality, church, if that's how you worship, if you're waiting for him to prove himself, What you're really doing is your worship is in vain because you're not worshiping the vine, him. You're actually just worshiping the fruit. It's all about the fruit for you and it has nothing to really do with the vine. Why do you worship? We worship for who he is and what he's already done for us. If he never did another thing, sending Jesus was more than enough reason to worship him forever. You know, like the woman uh, in, in Luke chapter 7 uh, who, who had this alabaster jar. And it was this jar uh, filled with this very expensive oil, this perfume. And, and this woman understood the heart of worship. She understood the value of Jesus. And, 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 and what she did is, is that Jesus was at this, at this Pharisee's house and they're having dinner together. And this woman... She wasn't invited to the house. She didn't get an invitation to the dinner party, but yet she, she comes through the door and she opens it up and she interrupts their entire dinner, their entire moment. And unexpectedly, she comes in with this jar of oil that would cost a year's wages and she begins to pour it out all over Jesus. And she pours it out on his feet. And, and, and the Bible says that she gets down on her knees and she's weeping with gratitude and with with worship. And she begins to even wipe his feet with her very hair and her tears. For this woman to interrupt the whole moment, for this woman to, to come and worship Jesus in this way, this was a sacrifice. This was a costly worship. She sacrificed her pride and she sacrificed her comfort. Look at this in 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen. 15. It said, isn't, isn't long hair a woman's pride? This woman sacrificed her pride. She put herself aside. She didn't care what anybody else in the room thought. She stooped low to his feet and worshiped him because she understood the value of Jesus. And she poured out a worship that was costly. She poured out a worship that was worthy. She gave a gift of worship that was fit for a king. And some of us refuse to raise our hands because of what people might think. I know I said it again. I said it before. I'll say it again. Some of us, we just won't engage in worship, and we'd rather just let everybody else do it. We'd rather let the worship team just worship instead. Worship is going to cost you your pride. And you've got to be willing 
to put yourself aside, to put your comfort aside, to put your pride aside so that you can worship him. Because did Jesus not humble himself for you on the cross? Is he not worthy? Jesus goes on to to speak to this woman in verse 48 as she's worshiping. He says, woman, your sins are forgiven. See, this woman was willing to acknowledge her sin and she came and worshiped the only one who could forgive her sin. Think about in your life what you've been forgiven of. Think about what Jesus has done in your life and the price he paid for you. What has he forgiven you of? What has he redeemed you from? What has he purchased you out of? What has he freed you from? Because when you consider the cross and when you consider the work and the blood of Jesus, how can you not humble yourself and worship him in such a way that costs you something that is sacrificial? How can we hold on to our pride and our convenience and our comfort when we know he never did that for us? He laid aside everything and he became a man and he lived a perfect life and he bore the sins of humanity so that you could be whole, forgiven, set free, redeemed, and you could have life forevermore. And we're going to hold on to our worship until he does more? Man, worship is our response to what he's already done. But here's the thing. Worship is also, also a result of what God has done. It's because of the blood of Jesus that there's no veil between us and the Holy of Holies. It's because of the blood of Jesus, might I remind you, that we have been made right with God. Which means that when God looks at you and me, all he sees is that we are in right standing with him because of the blood of Jesus that literally covers us from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet. It's because of the blood of Jesus that we can actually stand and give God praise and glory and honor and worship. We can only be in the presence of God because of the blood that was shed by Jesus on the cross. And I just want to ask you today, when's the last time you just said thank you? When's the last time we stopped looking at God and and saying, hey, I'll worship you if you can do more? I'll worship if you try harder. I'll worship if you show up more. Uh, God, I'll worship you if you finally answer my prayer request. I- I'll worship you when you do something like that. When's the last time you just said, hey, thanks for everything you've already done. Thanks for who you already are. I have more than enough reason to worship you forever. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 100 and verse 4 it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and, and his courts with praise, give thanks to him and praise his name forever and ever and ever. If Jesus was willing to humble himself for you, how can we not humble ourselves for him? If he was willing to let go of his comfort for you, how can we not let go of our comfort and our pride and worship him? How can we not give back to a God who's given us so much? So what are we praising him for? You say, Pastor, you're, uh, you're fired up. You got energy. Good for you. I, I don't understand why we worship him. If you still are struggling to understand why we praise him and why we worship him and why he's, he doesn't really have to do anything else because he's already done more than enough, let's go to Isaiah chapter 53 together. Let's go back to the suffering. Let's go back to the beating. Let's go back to the flogging where Jesus literally took your sin, your guilt, your shame, your penalty, and he put it on himself. All your past, present, and future sins, Jesus literally embodied them for you. How, how can we not worship? Look, look, let's just look together. Specifically in Isaiah 53, let's just look at verses 3 through 9 alone. It says Jesus was despised. He was rejected. A man of suffering and familiar with pain like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But Jesus... He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace with God was on him. 
and by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the sins, the iniquity of us all. Jesus was oppressed. Jesus was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Why? Because he was choosing you. Jesus, he wasn't arrested. He gave himself up, and then they arrested him. He gave himself for you. He said, no one takes my life. I literally, I willingly lay it down for you. The Bible says that they, they, they tied him up to a post so that he could be whipped in, in, and he could be whipped in Roman fashion, which was flogging, which was sharp uh, animal's teeth. And, and, and there, there, were, there were bones that were sharp so that when they would whip him, it would rip the flesh off of him. And the Bible says that they, they, they tied Jesus up to a post, but they didn't have to tie Jesus to a post. Why? Because he would have held on to that post for you. He chose you. He, he literally was standing in your place and thinking of you the whole time. How can we not worship him? Verse 8, it says, By oppression and judgment, Jesus was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. One more scripture just to show you the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on your behalf. We got a lot to be grateful for. If he never did anything else, I've got so much to worship him for. Look at this, 1 Peter Chapter 2, verse 24, it says, Jesus personally, watch this. Listen to this, that he personally. Let this actually hit your heart today personally. Jesus personally carried your sins in his body on the cross that you can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. If he never did anything else, he doesn't have to prove himself. He doesn't have to show me more. He is worthy of a worship that costs you something. He is worthy of a worship that will cost you your pride, cost you your comfort. If he went all in for you, how can you not go all in for him? If the woman with the alabaster jar, laid everything aside and gave him a worthy worship? If the wise men were willing to make over a 500 mile journey that was difficult, that was painful, that was challenging, that was uncomfortable, if they were willing to give Jesus a worthy worship, in light of all that God is and all that God has done, in light of his worthiness, you need to ask yourself the question, is my worship, how I've been worshiping, is it worthy of him? Am I always only putting my hands in my pocket and letting everybody else engage and letting everybody else praise God and, and say thank you? And, and am, I, am I only letting the worship team do the worship leading? And Is your worship worthy of a king? I know he's, wor he's worthy of worship, but I, I wonder if our worship is worthy of him. It should cost you something. It should be sacrificial. It should, it should, it should, it should have some weight to it. If he went all in, if he gave everything, I, I just can't imagine any of us withholding our worship anymore. I want to end with, with 2 Samuel because David, David understood the value of God and, and all that God had done for him. And in 2 Samuel, uh, a prophet had come to David and instructed him to go and build an altar to worship the Lord and to offer sacrifices to him. And when David found the field that he was going to use to, to sacrifice and, 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 and um, perform burnt offerings unto the Lord, when he found that field, the owner of the field came out and said, hey, uh, I know what you're doing here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you just, just have this field for free. And David said, no, I, 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 I want to pay you for this field. 
Look what he says to him in, in verse 24. Chapter 24, verse 24, he says, I insist on paying you for it. I'm not going to just take this field for free. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David, it was sacrificial. It was costly. He bought the threshing floor and the oxen and he paid 50 shekels of silver for them. Why? Because David understood the value of God and his worship was worthy of a king. Is your worship, the way you've been a, a, a approaching God with your worship, is it worthy of a king? Is it fit for a king? Let go of your pride. Let, let go of your comfort. Lay aside this vending machine mentality where you're just trying to, to worship so that you can get something from God. Let's worship from a place of who he is and what he's already done. The team is going to lead us in a song as we conclude our service today. And I just want you to worship God in a way that maybe you've never worshiped him before. Wherever you're watching this, maybe you're in the car I just want you to really think about what he's done and who he is. If you're not in the car and you're at home watching this, why don't you just put your hands up, this act of surrender? What if, it, what if it's uncomfortable? What if, man, is, is he not worthy of letting go of our comfort and our pride? Maybe for you, it's actually singing along and not just simply watching the, the team on the screen. Whatever you need to do, Make sure that the worship you give him today is worthy of who he is and what he's done. This is the heart of worship. Father, we love you so much. God, we are so grateful for all that you are and all that you've done. Thank you for sending us Jesus. Jesus, thank you for humbling yourself and coming to this fallen, broken planet in living a perfect, sinless life, in bearing the weight of all of our transgressions and iniquities and taking all of our debt and paying it in full. You took every sickness. You took every disease. You took every imperfection. You took every flaw of humanity and you put it on yourself. For our sins were on you while you hung on the cross and while you were beaten to a bloody pulp. And it's because of your blood that we even have the ability to worship. God, thank you. Jesus, you are so good. You are so wonderful. May we give you worship that is worthy, that is costly, that is sacrificial in light of all that you are and all that you've done. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We love you all. Have a wonderful week. Thank you for listening to the Community of Faith Church Online podcast. If you have any questions at all, you can email admin at cufchurches.com. And if you're new with us today and looking for the next step, go to cufchurches.com slash get connected. And finally, if you feel led to give, go to cufchurches.com slash give or click the give button on the CUF app. Thank you and have a wonderful day.